Okay, can you uh, explain the incident where Psycho Mike and Phil Carson went to Amir Muhammad's house in San Diego? Mm hmm. So they were trying to track down um, Amir Muhammad, Harry Billups. And he's living down in the Chula Vista area, San Diego. And um, they've got this informant, Psycho Mike, who um, was actually an informant for a, a special agent friend of mine named Tim Flaherty. Tim was Mike's handler. And uh, Mike found himself in jail. I think it was after a robbery case. And he's a known informant. So he's in the snitch module of the jail, um, along with other guy named Wayman Anderson. The two of them get in there and they start conspiring together about how they're going to provide information to the LAPD about Biggie and Tupac, I'm sorry, about Biggie's murder. So uh, Wayman Anderson comes to the LAPD, tells his story, hoping to get some you know, response. And then Michael Robinson goes to the LAPD and tells his story. Um, and uh, of course, everything Mike says in his in his um, initial interview is all contrary to information that we know to be true about Harry Billups. So Ted Ball, who was the interviewing investigator at LAPD, who goes down there, he, he walks out of there and he goes back and he's like, dude, this dude's obviously full of shit. And, you know, and he also realizes that Michael Robbins has tremendous um, um, mental health issues. And when he's not taking his medication, he goes off the rails. He suffers from extreme mental health issues from childhood abuse, horrific childhood abuse. And when he's not on his meds, he's a complete nut, paranoid, helicopters hovering over him and people who try, you know. So this is the nature of the individual, the informant that my friend Tim Flaherty is trying to manage because Tim's using him as a dope informant. And a dope informant is just a guy that you put a few money, you know, put a few dollars in his pocket and you send him into a house to buy some dope. Come out, he gives you the dope. You got enough probable cause now to write a search warrant, you raid the house. So these dope informants are a dime a dozen. You know, I, I had dozens of them myself. And they're just usually people, they're criminal in nature, but they're just usually drug addicts who are trying to either work off some case or they need money in their pocket. And so Michael Robinson's that type of informant. And uh, um, he tells the LAPD that he um, knows something about Biggie's murder. LAPD interviews him. They kind of discard him because of all the shit that he's saying that could be proven to be untrue. And um, he's not the kind of witness that you need in this kind of case. Well, down the road, Phil Carson opens up his public corruption investigation against the LAPD and particularly pursuing David Mack. And Carson asked Phil, I'm sorry, uh, Carson asked Tim, you know, can I use your informant? Something to that effect. And Tim's like, yeah, go for it. If you want to utilize him to go further your case, go for it. And so they didn't have history, Carson and Michael Robinson, the informant. Um, so he starts working with him and uh, they decide that they're going to go down to San Diego to Chula Vista and confront Amir Mohammed and uh, Michael Robinson's going to wear a wire, a little bit like what we were going to do with Keefe D and Zip. Um, so uh, Michael Robinson's got a wire on. He goes there, and of course Harry Billups is like, "Who the fuck is this on my front porch?" Right? He doesn't know who this guy. And if you see Michael Robinson, he's he looks a little bit crazy. And if you don't recognize him, you don't know him. You're not going to just open the door. And you're certainly not going to sit there and invite him in. So at some point, um, Billups opens the door and basically tells Robinson, what are you doing here? And Mike's speaking very weird. He's like, oh, I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you. And Billups like, get the fuck off my porch. Get out of here. I'm going to call the cops, which is exactly what he does. He calls the police and says, there's a, there's a crazy person who's coming to my house. And uh, please send a police unit out here because uh, I don't know what he's doing. I don't know what he's up to. I don't know him. So please come and get him. Now, if you knew him, the last, and you were involved in a murder, 
That's the last guy that you'd want to call the cops on, right? <laughs> so the fact that Harry Billups calls the cops and says, come get this guy, and this is all documented. It's all in the files of the, invest or of the uh, officer that responded to the scene. And then Harry Billups is pissed because they don't arrest Michael Robinson. Because unbeknownst to Harry Billups, the FBI has told that cop, like, hey, he's our, he's our informant. Sorry about that. Um, the FBI has told in this, this, uh, this uniformed officer, that's our informant. Just like, play it cool, play it cool. So the uniformed officer's like, I don't know what's going on down here. I'll leave it alone. Well, Michael, um, Harry Billups is like upset. Like, I called you to my house. This guy's, do something with him. Do something about him. So then he goes down to the police station because he's so upset that they haven't taken any action. And so he goes to the police station and complains down there saying, you know, what's the deal? You know, why can't I get the police service I deserve? Unbeknownst to him, it's because the FBI has asked that police agency to leave their informant alone. So that's what happened. The whole thing was a big debacle. It's actually funny. And the whole thing's a joke. Um, it did not work out in any way, shape, or form. And if, this is an important thing, if there was anything really of value to have gained from that investigatively, it's going to be on that recording. And that recording would have been preserved. And that would have been made into transcripts. And that would have been used. It doesn't exist. And if it does exist, there's nothing there, which is, again, why it has never been, re you know, it's never surfaced to reach the time of day. But if there was a conversation that took place that was in any way incriminating, it would have appeared on that recorder. And it would have been preserved, and it would have been translated, transcribed, and there would have been those documents. So where are they? Make sense? Okay. Yep. That's what um, happened. It was just a joke. It was a... It was a poorly run operation that resulted in nothing because there was never anything there to begin with other than the fanatical machinations of a mentally ill person. All right. Uh, can you talk a little bit about Michael DeRoe and, um, you know, the story of him um, trying, to, trying to lie, I guess, is, is the best way I could phrase it? Yeah, Darrell was in Pelican Bay. Obviously, we knew that he was a close friend of um, Orlando Anderson's. Um, Darrell's known as a shooter. He's a very dangerous guy. He's up in Pelican Bay State Prison. We go to interview him because he's claiming that he knows something and he wants to tell us about it. And of course, like all jailhouse informants, they want to tell you about it because they want something in return. He wanted to go to, I think it was Soledad Prison, which is where his dad was. So he's like, I'll tell you everything I know, but in order to do that, you need to transfer me someplace. Like Pelican Bay is the worst prison in California. It's like the last, you know, you'd probably rather be in San Quentin or Folsom than Pelican Bay. Um, it's the worst, it's considered like one of the worst prisons to be in. He wanted to get out of there and go to Soledad, I think it was, where his dad was. And uh, so we go and we're like, okay, well, we'll consider it. Tell us what you know. So he tells us this whole story about meeting with Suge Knight and meeting with Orlando Anderson and doing all of this stuff. Well, unbeknownst, and then we say, well, who else was there? And he tells us that his, that his cousin, I think his name was Kevin Maples or something like that. He tells us that his cousin was part of this and can... Um, um, reaffirm what he's going to tell us, that, he, that his cousin will um, also tell it, whatever. I'm not a loss for words there for him. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, so we're like, okay, fine. We're here, yeah. We'll write all this down. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not. We'll see. But we also began to monitor all of his outgoing phone calls and incoming phone calls and all of his mail. Because after we have this conversation, we want to see what he does and what he says. And so we intercept a phone call where he's calling his cousin and basically telling his cousin, no, oh, here's the deal, man. I, I need you to do me a favor. The cops come and talk to you. I need you to say this. I need you to kind of tell them that you were there. Tell them that you were part of this meeting. Tell them everything that I told them. So now we know he's made this all up because he's got to call somebody 
that he claims was a witness to all this and convince them to, in fact, lie for him. So once we know that's, then, then you know, Michael Duro is of no use for us after this. The, there's no use for him because he's now provably um, providing false information. Make sense? Yep. All right, so um, the next one, can you talk about the gun that was found in Compton, um, how you guys found it, what you believed it was, and what it ended up um, actually being after you sent it off to uh, Vegas? Yeah, we, we didn't find it, meaning the LAPD. Um, law enforcement found it, I believe. From what I understand, it was um, one of a guy named Corey Edwards, they called him C. Ray. He was a, so he's affiliated with the Southside Crips. He was actually in Vegas and part of the crew out there in Vegas um, that was together right before Tupac was murdered. So Corey Edwards um, had a girlfriend and I believe this house, and I could be wrong about this, but it's very close to this. The house where this gun was found was either her parents' house or somehow was connected to Corey Edwards' wife and girlfriend girlfriend and then wife um, and I think the father was in the backyard cleaning the backyard and he finds a gun that had clearly been thrown over the fence and so he calls the police department and um, they come and confiscate the gun take it into custody and they book it and then it is in a you know basically a vault with all the other firearms that have been, you know, um, confiscated over the years from Compton Police Department. So when we bring Tim Brennan into our task force and we ask him, hey, can you go back um, in time and try to determine around the time of Tupac and Biggie's murders, um, all of Glock, I'm sorry, all the 40 caliber Glocks and all nine millimeters that in any way, shape, or form could be related to this case. Let's go back and make sure that they were all um, tested ballistically, that all of them were, you know, examined. And he found one, a 9mm, that, uh, I'm sorry, a, um, a Glock 40, um, that's the one that was found in the backyard of um, the home. And so we have it, we take it down to our forensics, our lab, and a firearm analyst pulls up the photographs and does a ballistic match based on the photographs of the impressions of the ammunition that were used in Tupac's murder and then the impression um, of this gun. It's a photographic match, which means next, the next level of inspection is an actual, you know, forensic expert doing eyes on like doing the actual examination through a microscope. We had a match on photographs. Um, obviously the, bliss, the evidence, the shell casings are in Las Vegas. Um, so we decide, well, the ATF, who uh, is going to transport the gun, the ATF takes it to Vegas. We give it to their lab. And they do their own examination. They say, this is not the gun, it doesn't match. And then they gave the gun back to ATF. So we were really, hopeful and excited because we knew we had a good photographic match, but the actual uh, more intensive examination, Vegas said it wasn't a match, so I have to accept that as being true.